I am here at a giant wind farm outside of Medicine Bow, Wyoming, and it is very windy. Over the last century, cities like Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas reshaped the American West by building coal plants and hydropower dams to fuel their growth. Now these cities are doing it again, only this time with solar farms, wind turbines, and power lines. I traveled to Wyoming to the construction site of America's largest wind farm. Then I road tripped along the route of the 732 mile power line that's going to be built to carry that electricity to California. California and the desert southwest, they need a reliable source of power and they need it in large quantities. When we pursue renewable energy development in a, uh, an environmentally tone deaf way, we're going to have major impacts on elk, on sage grouse, on pronghorn, and we can't afford to squander our opportunity to save the little fragments of wildness that we have left. I'm Sammy Roth, and this is Repowering the West, a new LA Times series on the shift to climate-friendly energy. What makes this such a good place to build wind power? It's the way the wind comes through the mountains here. And that's why people like the, the state of Wyoming to build wind farms in. It is windy in a lot of areas. Standing beneath one of these wind turbines is terrifying and awe-inspiring. The blades are 219 feet long, and you feel like you're going to get smacked in the head every time one of them swoops down. It doesn't help that I know the tip of each blade can move at nearly 200 miles per hour. What was the impetus to start getting into the wind business? Uh, you know, it was starting to be cost effective for our customers. They were able to show that these new wind sites could compete with some of the coal and other generations that we have. The uh, larger wind turbines have so much more advanced technology than the older ones. The towers he used to climb in, you had to hoof everything up the ladder. Warren Buffett owns this wind farm. But it's small compared to the one being built on Overland Trail Ranch, 50 miles away. This will be the site of America's biggest wind farm. It's 500 square miles, a little bigger than Los Angeles. The wind farm is being built by Phil Anschutz, who owns the Coachella Music Festival, the LA Kings hockey team, and Crypto.com Arena, formerly Staples Center. Anschutz owes his $11 billion fortune in part to oil and gas. One of the craziest things about this wind farm that we're going to see is that they're basically building it on spec. The Anschutz company has spent like hundreds of millions of dollars permitting and beginning to construct this wind farm and the transmission line, and they, they don't have a buyer for the energy yet. Bill Miller is a longtime oil and gas landman who oversees Anschutz's energy and agriculture businesses. He took us to the top of the Continental Divide, the dividing line between the watersheds of the western and eastern United States. Now the ranch is 320,000 acres, 500 square miles. Permanent residents on the ranch, we have three. Yeah. So looking at the Continental Divide here, got Bridger Pass over there, kind of the low point, which is where Jim Bridger passed through on the Overland Trail. And on this side of the mountains, everything drains to the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. And on the other side, it all drains to the Gulf of California through the Colorado. How many wind turbines are you guys going to put out here? 600 plus. It's huge. There aren't many projects that can compete with this on scope or scale. I mean, solar and batteries is a fabulous solution. And at what point does the cost become prohibitive to do that? So we just look at it and say, okay, the market is going to be there. Wind, I think, is going to be one of the key elements of the transition. What we're all going for, I think, in the end, is going to be a cleaner energy sector. Did you think when you started in 2008 that here in 2022 you'd still be doing this? No. <laughs> we had no idea it would take this long. Miller has been trying to get this wind farm permitted and built for nearly 15 years, in part because not everyone is in love with the project. So this new wind thing has really rocked a lot of boats because for a while there they were looked at as the enemy. Every watt of power the wind farm makes is a watt of power the fossil fuels is not going to sell. Some of that's changed because a lot of people are now working for the wind farm. 
The biggest part of having the wind farms take place in our vicinity is taxes. Six percent of a few billion dollars is a lot of money. So we educated ourselves and got comfortable with it. Just like probably you were scared to death first time you got on a bicycle because it could hurt you. But then you found out how to use it and now you have a wind farm. <laughs> Once local politicians got on board with the wind farm, there was another hurdle getting permission to build the 732 miles of power line. Here we are out in the middle of nowhere, very far from markets, and we're generating electricity that's going to Las Vegas or Portland, in this Los case. Los Angeles. Right, and in Los Angeles. And so, you know, when, you, when you're generating the electrons so far away from the markets where they're actually gonna be used, you have to have a transmission line that might cost billions of dollars to, to bring that to market. The big problem with the transmission line and the wind farm, says Molvar, is how they affect the wildlife habitats where they're built. This eastern end of the Red Desert, this is one of the last strongholds for sage grouse in the world. This is something that's precious, and we can't afford to squander our opportunity to save the little fragments of wildness that we have left. While the Anschutz team is taking steps to limit harm to wildlife, Mulvar says it's not enough. He says it would be better to build wind projects on farmlands that have already lost much of their ecological value. Quite frankly, we probably shouldn't be building utility scale renewables projects on public lands at all. And if we had sound environmental policy coming out of Congress and coming out of the White House, they would be saying, let's not build any of these utility scale projects until we have solar panels on every single rooftop. We were talking about the Biden administration pushing renewable energy on public lands, but they've also endorsed that 30 by 30 target, protect 30% of America by 2030. So it's, it's interesting to see how those things maybe come into conflict with each other, isn't it? Well, it is, but also there's an opportunity to solve both problems and achieve both goals at the same time. If we are smart about renewable energy development and where it's sited, and we do have opportunities to find places to put these wind farms and these solar farms and, and these photovoltaic panels in places that don't have major ecological costs. It's pretty interesting. We need renewable energy, clearly. I mean, there needs to be lots and lots of this stuff built to address climate change and reduce emissions. And at the same time, how do you do it in a way with the least environmental damage possible? And gosh, it's just difficult to parse through. So I'm standing here along the North Platte River, which flows right through the Anschutz wind farm site. And right behind us, we've got a real big transmission line, just like the one that Anschutz wants to build towards California. I wanted to see all the land that would need to be crossed by this transmission line to get wind energy to California. So we hopped in the car and drove along the planned route. So we're standing here right alongside Highway 40 in Moffat County, Colorado. It took us about three hours to get here from Rollins, Wyoming. The Transwest Express power line is going to cross this highway right here and then join up and run right alongside this existing power line. You're starting to see the river corridor oh, yeah, down. See the amphibian down there. Yeah, this is a, where they're going to cross is one of the prettiest places. The easement that we have on Cross Mountain Ranch says very explicitly that commercial power lines are prohibited. What they did the conservation easement for was to conserve this legacy property that means a lot to them for future generations. For better or for worse, that the Bodecker family ultimately reached a deal and agreed to let the power lines through here up the river, good thing or bad thing? I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, Sammy. It's just kind of a thing. Transwest in particular, I think, is one of the highest priority infrastructure projects in the entire nation. your mind, I mean, this is part of the monument experience when people come off of Highway 40 in this direction. And that explains, as I understand it, why at the monument you're not so thrilled about two power lines getting built across the road here. Is that right? I mean, I think it's overstating it to say I'm not thrilled about it. I would say what it's going to do is it's going to, that experience that people have is going to be interrupted by these power lines. We're standing here uh, outside of Roosevelt City, Utah, historically a big oil and gas town. 
and the uh, Transwest Express power lines would run right across this sewer lagoon facility here that the city owns. You definitely got folks in town here who are not happy about seeing another power line running across the farmland and so close to town. After seven days on the road, I finally made it to Boulder City, Nevada, where the Transwest Express power line would end and all that wind energy would be injected into California. Taking this trip made me realize how hard it's going to be to solve the climate crisis. There are just so many conflicts out there on the land, but there's common ground too, if we're willing to look for it. For me, the biggest issue that we all face right now is this conflict between more conservation at the same time we need more renewable energy. You're going to see this country transition away from fossil fuels, but it's not going to happen overnight. It has to be organized and it's going to take a long time for that to happen. We can produce all the energy that this country needs from renewable sources without having a major impact on the biodiversity and on the land. That's the future we need to get to. Thank you for watching. For more stories from our road trip, check out my article at latimes.com slash repoweringthewest and look out for more episodes in this series.